Hello, welcome to my presentation and thank you for inviting me. In the upcoming 20 minutes, you will learn about my study regarding the 18th century violin maker Benoit Joseph Boussu. Actually, I will not present one research pro project but two. The first one is my PhD study at Ghent University on the biography, instruments and working methods of this maker Boussu. As part of this, also instrument replicas were made. The second project is a related artistic project performed at the School of Arts Ghent, where replicas were used to explore Brussels chamber music from the mid 18th century. Some of you may have heard me present parts of this research at earlier conferences. However, since the PhD was completed last year and this CD album was released recently on Etc Records, I thought it was a good idea to do a final presentation to give a broader overview of the two finished projects. First follows a short introduction video and after that I will go into more detail on how the various aspects of this interdisciplinary study have interacted. This is a cello from 1757 in a near unaltered state of construction. It is preserved in the collection of the Musical Instruments Museum in Brussels, along with eight other instruments by the same maker. Very little was known about the maker of these instruments, until around 2009, when I started a study on his life, instruments and working methods. As a result of this research, the biography of Benoit Joseph Boussu is disclosed in much detail. We now know that he was born in the north of France, in a small village called Fourmi, in 1703. From 1729 onwards, he is a notary in the nearby town of Aven. Twenty years later, in 1748, however, Boussu gives up the notary profession. He becomes a violin maker, consecutively in Liège, Atterbeek near Brussels, the city of Brussels, and finally Amsterdam. This is a cittern made by Boussu in Amsterdam in 1771. In 1773, Boussu returns to Aven, where he dies in September of that year. This new biographical information, together with the results of initial instrument research, is published in the Galpin Society Journal of 2013, and later updated in Early Music Journal in November 2016. In the second stage of the current study, many of Boussu's surviving instruments are investigated, such as the before-mentioned cello and this violin, both retaining their original neck construction. These museum objects may not be played anymore in order to preserve their exceptionally preserved state, hence the decision to make replicas. Besides conventional organological methods, more advanced investigation techniques are applied during the current study such as digital endoscopy. Here we see the interior of a Boussu violin. The upper block was originally made in one piece with the neck. A first CT scan of an instrument by Boussu was made in 2010 at the Leiden University Medical Center. Two years later, the well-preserved Boussu violin from the Ming collection was scanned in the Brussels Erasmus Hospital. The results of this CT study were published in the Galpin Society Journal of 2016. In 2017, the well-preserved Boussu cello underwent a CT scan at the Brussels Saint Luc Hospital. Mm -hmm. 
scale one-to-one -one cross sections derived from CT data can serve as construction plans for instrument makers. A 3D image reconstruction provides even further insights into the architecture of a scanned instrument. Armed with all collected information, between spring 2017 and spring 2018, two violin replicas and one cello replica were built. Following a hypothesis on Boussou's original working methods, no inner mold is used. The entire making process is filmed and these videos are presented on the YouTube channel Boussou Inside Out. Similar working methods were used while making a cello replica. Videos of the cello construction can also be found on our YouTube channel. Three replicas were played by Ann Knop, Shiho Ono and Mathilde Wolfs during several public concerts and a CD recording of Brussels court music from the time of Boussu. As you could see in the video, the research performed included methodologies from various fields. Through archive research, the biographical study shed light on Boussou's family composition, places of residence and professional activities. Remarkably, Benoit-Joseph Boussou practiced as a notary for 20 years before becoming a violin maker. During the socio-economic research, over 200 legal acts were found for private business affairs of Boussou. These documents show that he was involved in financial and real estate transactions in his birth region of France. Over 50 original bowstring instruments by Boussou were investigated and documented during the instrument research phase. This provided a wealth of information on their design and construction. Radiological investigations, more specifically CT scanning of several of the original instruments, even further increased our understanding on how they were made. A hypothesis on Boussou's making methods was proposed. By building replica instruments, not only playable copies were obtained, but more importantly, the making hypothesis could be tested in practice, while further insights, knowledge and research questions regarding Boussou's instruments were generated as a result of this hands-on approach. Once the replica instruments were available, a search for suitable repertoire yielded 60 trio sonatas by Brussels composers from the mid-18th century. Documenting recordings were made for all these works. Various concerts were organized and a CD was recorded. I will now discuss a few examples on how the different facets of our study interacted, resulting in a more diverse and coherent type of research output. I hope to illustrate how such an interdisciplinary project can enhance our knowledge of historical makers, especially the lesser known ones that have not been studied intensively so far. This first example shows how results from biographical research can complement and confirm information found on instruments. The label of Boussou's first known creation, a cello, states that it was built in Liège in 1749. Boussou's short stay in this city was confirmed by a baptism record for one of his sons. Similarly, Boussou's presence in Atterbeek, Brussels and Amsterdam could be confirmed by both instrument labels as well as a multitude of archive documents. In this second example, an interaction between the fields of instrument research and socio-economic study is illustrated. 
From numbering in Boussu's instruments, it becomes clear that the workshop could produce around 15 violins and 3 cellos yearly. From these numbers, we conclude that Boussu ran a workshop with a small team of employees. Nevertheless, we see a strong stylistic unity within all extant instruments, from which we conclude that Boussu himself was responsible for the finer work. In Boussu's instruments, idiosyncratic features are always observed, such as extremely uniform dimensions, pre-shaped rib parts and a neck and upper block from one piece of maple. From these observations, it is concluded that these instruments were built without a mold from the backplate upwards. All parts could be prefabricated, which allowed for a modular assembly and a division of labor. From the strong stylistic unity observed in all instruments, independent of making location, it is concluded that Boussu himself was responsible for the execution of these details. The idea of a modular making system was partly conceived as well as tested during our instrument replication activities. This is where another study field is addressed namely that of workbench research. The workshop organization for Boussu thus proposed shows strong resemblance to the pyramidal entrepreneurial model as put forward by Herbert Heide. This model includes division of labor while the entrepreneur is still strongly involved with the practical activities in the workshop. Such practice allows for instruments of a consistent and high artistic quality. According to Heide, the entrepreneur should also have financial means to start up his business. Indeed, Boussu had continuous income from his financial investments, as we have shown in our socio-economic study. The fourth prerequisite, put forward by Heide, that of affinity with craft and music, could not be demonstrated for Boussu during our research. Here is an example illustrating how the field of radiology provided information for the replication process. CT scan data of original instruments was used to create templates for the construction of the replicas. Furthermore, maps such as these gave detailed information on plate thicknesses, arching patterns and wood densities of the originals. This data could again be applied for the replication. We were able to select wood for our replicas of highly similar density as the wood in the original instruments. Eventually, the partial and total weights of the replica violins differed only a few grams compared to the original violin on which they were based. To take this idea a step further, all completed replica instruments were CT scanned as well, in order to be able to further compare them to the originals. It has to be said that the aim of our replication activities was not to create the perfect replica, since this is not possible anyway. Rather, the replication was a form of research, assessing the proposed construction hypothesis and associated techniques. We believe, however, that our replicas share many close similarities to the instruments that came out of Boussu's workshop 270 years ago. Also, we have to realize that the many original instruments must have slightly differed mutually as well. In this final example, I hope to demonstrate that the involvement of a present-day instrument maker in the field of musical performance practice can lead to some unexpected and refreshing directions. Already in 2010, I had the idea to build a string trio composed of two violins and a cello to perform 18th century trio sonatas. As period sheet music was being collected, for example from the online database IMSLP, I noticed that the many editions prescribed the possibility of a performance without a chordal instrument. In this example shown here, from the Brussels composer Van Maldere, this option is indicated by the red circle. However, such a performance practice is nowadays completely overlooked by existing ensembles. In the large range of CDs I collected with 18th century trio sonata repertoire, none of them features solely a string trio. My inability to build a harpsichord, organ or lute forced me to make a trio of only bowed string instruments. And then the period sheet music made me aware of the fact that such a combination was an accepted option in the past. Thus, my limitations as a maker ultimately resulted in an out-of-the-box perspective, overlooked by present-day musicologists and performers. Luckily, our CD recording, using such a minimalist ensemble, 
was well received in the music press. Several reviewers specifically praised the string trio only approach as can be read in these two excerpts. To conclude, I now summarize some key concepts that were employed and explored within the current study. Firstly, there is the interdisciplinary approach, where the methodologies of various fields yielded diverse and complementing data. This resulted in a rich and coherent research output. The four above examples are only a few of the many instances where the interaction between the various research perspectives resulted in a more profound understanding of the subject. Secondly, by focusing on a single maker, but involving a multitude of contextual information, it became possible to provide counter-evidence for some prevailing ideas that rule within the violin research community. For example, the violin maker Boussu, a former notary, had not a typical background in the master apprentice system. His apparent social and geographic mobility may make us wonder about the presumed rigidity of the 18th century society. Our focus on an unknown maker, but with a remarkable life course, may be inspirational for future research, away from the obvious famous names of the trade. Finally, inclusion of practice-oriented research performed by a researcher with violin-making experience was beneficial for obtaining diverse and refreshing understandings which extended beyond the traditional approaches in organology. I would like to end by thanking these people and institutions that contributed to this research and thank you for your attention. After the acknowledgements follows a short clip with a preview of our follow-up project.